have our guest joining us, Aaron Simon. Aaron is the Director of Sustainability and Development at the World Wildlife Fund. She's interested in how the materials we use for packaging like plastic impact our environment and what we can do to help minimize those impacts. So at WWF, she works to protect the Earth's natural resources by staying up to date with new technologies that can make uh, materials more earth friendly. Then she works with different companies to help uh, then utilize and implement uh, some of those materials. So Aaron, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We've got a great group of classrooms from Canada and the US joining us and we're looking forward to learning with you today. Thanks so much. Ready for me to share or are we gonna do? Uh, no, let, let's go for it. All right, excellent. All right, let me bring up my presentation here guys. Alrighty. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you guys, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to, to listen to me share a little bit about my work. Um, like Joe mentioned, I'm at World Wildlife Fund here in the U.S., and I lead up a lot of work on research and development, focused on helping to take all of that complicated science that is out there and um, translating it in a way that we can apply it to doing stuff to solve these big global issues. Uh, and one of the big issues that I have been tasked with helping us to figure out how to solve is this problem of plastic that's ending up in nature. Um, I thought I would start today by telling you just a little bit about myself and how I came to this job at, um, at World Wildlife Fund. Um, it, it, it wasn't a path that as when I was your age, I knew I was going to take. And so um, I feel like it's sort of an interesting story. I, I, I grew up in Michigan and um, went to school there. And, and in trying to figure out what I wanted to do, ended up at Michigan State University and um, with not a, a lot of, a, a, of, of an idea of who I wanted to be when I grew up, but um, I got into engineering, into material science and packaging and, and really loved that and um, got a degree in packaging engineering and, and from there went to Hewlett Packard. I don't know if you guys recognize who Hewlett Packard is, but they make computers and printers. Um, and I spent 10 years with Hewlett Packard doing design and um, procurement, which is buying materials and, and testing a lot of products to make sure that those uh, materials were doing what we needed them to do um, in, that, in that system, right, in the system of packaging and protecting printers and computers so that they could travel all over the world and get into your home. And so I spent a lot of time all over the world testing these products and, and traveling a lot and learning a lot. Um, and in my last, the last half of my 10 years there, I started to focus on these materials and in the environment and what role companies have to play to make sure that they are making good choices and responsible choices about how they use those materials. And as I was doing that work, I got to know this organization called World Wildlife Fund, represented by the adorable panda. And... Um, really started to evolve my thinking on, on, on the, the power that companies have to drive change. And so um, I, was then, I was then hired by World Wildlife Fund about eight years ago to lead up how we teach companies what to do, how we help them to make better decisions, because um, they, do, they, they take a lot of resources from our planet and they sell that product to everyone in the world. And, um, and so there's, there's a responsibility that comes along with doing that in a really responsible way. Um, and so on my team right now, I have a whole bunch of different types of scientists who do not just material science and packaging, but look at the things we grow, the water, we, the water um, sheds we impact, and um, the climate systems that these companies have an impact on, always trying to look at the science that exists and helping companies to figure out what role they have to play and how they can make an impact. So on this issue of plastic waste, um, I spend the most of my time. I, it has, um, in the last five years, um, rap, um, swiftly ramped up, and, and there is momentum everywhere around how we are going to uh, not only um, tackle this issue, but also understand it better. And that's obviously, if you think about the role we play um, that I just described, like understanding the issue and understanding the best ways that we can um, drive change to solve for this issue is, is a huge role that WWF likes to play in this space, making sure that we are using the best known science to date um, 
and, and trying to apply it to all the, right, all the right people who have a role to play. So as Joe highlighted, um, this is a massive issue today, right? We have, we, have, we have 8 million tons of trash, plastic trash, entering the ocean um, every year. That, that's just unfathomable, really. And um, it has become clearer and clearer that if we don't stop immediately, if we don't turn off what we call this tap of plastic that's just flowing into the ocean, in, in, you know, in the coming decades, there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. And um, we depend on our oceans for our climate systems, uh, for the air we breathe, for a lot of the protein we consume on the planet. And so we want to keep our oceans healthy because they're really important to us. And so having plastic flowing into them is just, uh, it's just not a viable solution for a future that we want to see and that we want our children's children to see. And so another, the key aspect of this that, that really touches home with folks, and that I think most of you have probably heard about, is the impact this has on species, right? We know that today over 800 types of species have come in contact with plastic. They could be entangled in it like this poor sea turtle. They could have eaten it because they confused it for food, or their food was growing on the plastic. Um, or it could have um, got caught up in their ecosystem and changed where they ha their habitat in a way that, um, that makes it so they can't live there any longer. Um, and all of those interactions are, are bad, right? We don't want that to happen. It doesn't belong here. And so you ask yourself, how does, how does this happen? How do we get to a point where we have so much plastic entering our ecosystems? And a great study was done back in 2015 by a scientist by the name of Jenna Jembeck. And she asked this question. She said, why is it there? And, you know, I think um, there can be a lot of theories, but what was really eye-opening about this piece of um, research was that it said, we have forgotten part of the system. When you guys think about this circular system of we make, we take something from the planet, we make it into something, we use it, and then we, that's where we stopped, really. We have to get it back and recycle it and make it into more. And, and we sort of missed trying to solve for the back end of that system. And so what that science said was that we have limited and lacking waste management globally, and especially um, and that's especially prevalent in areas of the world where they are, have a lo they've had lower economies, smaller economies, and they have booming populations that are now getting access to more stuff. And so when I look at this picture, I think to myself about the disproportionate way we have innovated materials. We have made all kinds of amazing plastics that bring value to our lives in not just food packaging, but... Um, medical packaging and construction and electronics and apparel and um, cars <laughs> and airplanes. Um, but what we haven't done is we haven't invested and we haven't innovated in the area of what to do with them when we're done with them so we can keep getting um, that value back. And just to give you a little perspective on this, in the last 15 years, um, half of the plastics ever made were produced. And so this issue has just sort of really quickly ramped up and it's hit ahead. And so we, we feel like it's super, really super important that we get out ahead of it. And what's really um, fascinating is when you look in these, in these coastal communities where this issue is a really big problem, you're looking at communities that are facing what we call other socioeconomic challenges. Um, they may struggle to put food on their table or to have a roof over their head or um, you know, to make sure that their children can go to school. And when, that, when you're facing all of those challenges at once, it's really hard for you to ask those, those communities to prioritize waste. And so we have to be really conscious about these, you know, how we're gonna help enable solutions and, and, and help to solve for this problem when there, are, when there are a lot of things that are going on in these places that are impacted the most. From a conservation perspective, when you have a lot of waste that is accumulating, um, not only does it impact those communities by, by its presence and the fact that it creates, you know, sometimes an unhealthy environment from a water and soil and air perspective, but you can imagine the fish that are supposed to be living in this water, are, are their, their, their ecosystems are sort of being choked, and so the fish stocks are decreasing, meaning the number of fish are going down. And so those, these communities are often, um, these coastal communities make up the majority of our fishermen in the world. And, um, 
and they they depend on those fishing stocks for both their livelihood and their food, and so you can imagine how devastating this is um, for them. But what's been so interesting about this issue is that globally, across all these different cultures and across all these different perspectives, um, we all have the same reaction to a photo like this. We all say it just doesn't belong there. Like we don't, like plastic does not belong in nature. And so the first reaction that we often have is, well, let's get rid of it. We need to get rid of plastic. Plastic is bad. And the reality is, is, is that not, that's not totally the case. Plastic actually has environmental value. Um, today, plastic is a big part of why we, are, we decrease food waste, because it extends shelf life. And what that means is that by wrapping food in plastic, you allow it to last that long distance we decided to ship it, and to last on the, on the retail shelf in the store for longer, because we shop less frequently, and it can last longer in our refrigerator. And it doesn't go to waste, because that food waste itself comes at an environmental cost. It lightweights um, our vehicles and our airplanes, which means they have lower emissions from a climate perspective. And so what we're challenged with, right, is this, this material that is clearly wreaking havoc on our, on our planet, but it's also bringing a great deal of value to humanity. And so how do, you, how do you address that intersection? And that's where an organization like World Wildlife comes in. Um, we really look at problems in a holistic nature, and that's because at the heart of our mission, right, at the heart of what we're trying to do is conserving the planet's um, resources for both, um, for both people and species in the future. And, and so the heart of that is this wildlife um, work. But you can't protect species if you don't protect their ecosystems, if you don't protect where they live and what they depend on. And so that's your forests, your oceans, your freshwater in, um, ecosystems. And then, of course, You've got these systems that we as humans depend on, the food and climate systems um, that are interacting within all of that. And so when we are looking at a large global problem like plastic waste, what we don't want to do is um, exchange one crisis for the other, right? Like we don't want to address plastic waste in such a way that we have much higher emissions or we are asking for much more from our forests or have much, um, you know, a, we, we lose a lot more food and so we have a higher environmental cost from that perspective. And so WWF looked at the problem of plastic waste and said we need to have a really holistic strategy. We need to have one that's not going to assume that, um, that one thing is going to solve this problem and it's going to be a sort of suite of solutions. And so last year, we came out with our strategy. And we said at the, at the, the vision of our strategy was to get to no plastics in nature by 2030. I mean, we also don't want any more plastics going into nature. It doesn't, it doesn't do good things when it's there. And it also represents waste. It represents a loss of resources that we took at the planet in the first place at a cost, right? Every time we cut down a tree or we, we mine for a mineral, that costs our planet something, right? It comes at an environmental cost. And so if we, just, you, if we just take it and then make it into something else and just throw it away when we're done with it, that's just not really being good stewards of those resources. So wouldn't it be great if we could create a system that anything we took from the planet, we could keep in that technical system and you reuse it over and over again? You know, then not having to go back to the planet to ask for more every time. And also getting that great added benefit of not having it end up in nature where we don't want it. And so that strategy is set up, and it looks at four key pillars, four key gr um, groups of, um, of people that we really need to engage on this in a positive way. Um, first of all, the cities. And those are the cities on the front lines of this issue. These are, this is in Southeast Asia, um, Philippines, Indonesia, China. Um, Thailand, these are, these are communities that, as, I, as you saw in those photos, are facing a lot of issues, and they need help, but they also need to be empowered, and they need to be helping. You know, they, this is, it's really important that you don't go into a place and tell them how to do something, that they sort of do it for themselves, and that you provide the you know, expertise and funding to support them. And so the city's work out of WWF, because we are located in over 90 countries, is to help those communities come together with the right experts and the right funding sources to make sure they can, they can help to enable better infrastructure and waste management. There is policy that's really important. As you can imagine, and you've probably heard of or seen, there's a lot of laws and legislation around um, waste and materials, and there are going to be more and more that come. Uh, and so we want to make sure that policy enables sensible solutions. Um, 
and that it, it helps to foster the, the value of those materials so people want to collect them and want to make them into something else and buy them again. Um, and so there's a lot of great work that we're focusing on the policy. And then, of course, there's the public. Um, working with the public is really important. Sharing these, this information with folks like you and with others so that they have that more knowledge. And that knowledge allows them to make better decisions in their lives um, so that they understand the implications of their choices, of their purchasing decisions, of their power through voting. Um, and so helping them to see, um, you know, what this, what the, how, how complex this issue is, but how much hope and how much potential there is and for us to solve it. And the last piece is working with companies. And as I mentioned before, this is sort of the work that I do. It's where we help companies to figure out the role they have to play. And they have a really unique role in this one in that they can help um, not only in rethinking the way they use the materials in the first place, and, um, but also being, you know, influencing and supportive of the, where those products are ending up, right? And so making sure that any products that they are selling into Southeast Asia matches the infrastructure, right, um, that they have there. So if they have a recycling facility, making sure that the products are packaged in materials that can be recycled there. Uh, they also have the ability to influence policymakers and make sure that they, um, that the policy is incentivizing that change and helping us to fund um, those important, um, that important sort of infrastructure and, and processes that, the, that every city needs. And of course, they can talk to you guys. They can talk about um, the choices they're making, they can help consumers understand why their products could be better or not. And so we do a lot of work with them, helping them to do that, helping them to connect them to the work on the ground in these cities, um, and, and, and making sure that year over year they're making progress. Because for us, all four of these pillars are essential for us getting to that no plastics in nature by 2030. So I thought I'd share with you um, two recent trips I took because um, this, these showing you slides with words on them are a whole lot less exciting. Um, but I've, I've been on a couple trips lately where, where I help to play that role that WWF likes to play, which is we, we help share what we know with others so that they can reach their potential. At the end of the day, World Wildlife Fund is not going to solve this on our own. We need everybody to be engaged. And so the more I can share what I know with you and you can take that and do something with that, the better. And so back in April, I went on this expedition. Um, it was called the Ocean Plastic Leadership Conference. And the idea was they were going to take a whole bunch of CEOs of plastic producers, um, a bunch of experts in the field and, and environmental NGOs, and trap us on a ship for four days in the middle of the North Atlantic Gyre. And I don't know if you guys know what gyres are, but um, the North Atlantic Gyre is off the east coast of, of, of North America. And um, it is a gyre is a place where a whole bunch of like streams come together, and they sort of create like um, an area in the middle where stuff can collect, where it kind of gets eddied in the middle there. And and what often happens in these gyres is that trash or stuff that's floating on the surface collects. And so the North Atlantic Gyre is one of those such places. And so we we hopped on this ship, and we we went into the North Atlantic with the with the goal to break down barriers to say. Why haven't we solved this problem? What are the things we can be doing? Let's really workshop through what is happening. And while we were out there, uh, any time we came on a patch of sargassum grass, which is this orange grass that you see in the photo, and that's just like floating seaweed, uh, we would stop the ship. We would put on our bathing suits, hop in um, to the zodiacs, and jump into 9,000 feet of water to clean the trash out of this sargassum grass. And so in this picture up above here, you can see what we collected. It's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing um, set of treasure. There's, there's a pop bottle. There's a part of a, a lawn chair. There's a shoe. There's a lot of crates. There is a toilet seat. Um, yeah, so tons of stuff that we were able to pull out of these jars. And it really, I think what that did was it really, it really anchored the issue with the people on board. It, it brought to the surface the urgency and the need for action. And when you, have, when you have CEOs of chemical companies and plastic producers and you have them in there and you have them looking at the problem, it's much easier to get them to say, yeah, I have a role to play and I'm going to do something to solve it. Um, we also spent a bit of time on the beach where that sargrass and grass would wash up. And you can see here the size of the trash that we're picking up is a lot different, right? This is where that plastic has been in the ocean for a lot longer and it's broken down. It's called microplastics. 
and um, and you just roll back that sargasm grass, and you can just pick. It's like a, it's like a confetti. It's just it's, there's so much plastic in there, and you can imagine how easy it is for um, fish and birds to to mistake that and eat it. And so as we as we took as we spent these four days on what um, looks like a large vessel but felt very small after being trapped on it for that long. Um, we, we really started to workshop through what the problems were and, and where the opportunity was. And you saw, you saw companies willing to make shifts. I'm standing in this picture with um, people from Burt's Bees, um, from Kimberly Clark, that's a tissue company, from Hasbro, the toy company, um, and students, a student from Stanford. And we are saying, okay, what if we, what if there were certain situations where we could get rid of packaging altogether? And what would that look like? And who would we need to engage? And how would we bring that together? And so these events like this, this expedition, are really allows us to bring all the right players together. And it really showcased on this larger scale how this ocean plastic issue is not one where one of these parties can do it on our own. And this work is continuing on. Any work that started on this ship um, will continue on. And it was really, it was really meaningful. So that's, that's a great example of some of the work that I do in the field with companies is to take them where the problem is is very obvious, and that helps to spark some, some, um, some interest and energy around solving it. Another trip I went on this summer was not with companies, but was with travelers. Because traveling um, is, is, is another way that, that people experience the world um, and, um, and actually encounter, you know, they, they have this challenge of how they manage all of the waste that they're carrying with them. And so there's this organization called Natural Habitat, which um, does eco-tours all over the world. And they like to take their guests to these really precious ecosystems and to showcase the beauty and power of the biodiversity that exists there so that those people can go home and take, you know, and, and continue to push for the belief in, um, in protecting those areas and saving those species and those ecosystems. And the remit of this trip to Yellowstone this summer was to do it zero waste. And that was um, a pretty high bar, um, a pretty extreme example where we would, we would literally carry our trash with us everywhere and we would measure it all at the end and see how well we did as a group of 12 people traveling all through Yellowstone National Park. And it was a really, it was an exciting trip where everybody learned lessons, including myself, um, as the resident expertise on materials and waste. Um, there to help people get through this experience and understand it. Um, and at the end of the day, what we did was um, our goal was to have only enough trash to fit in one mason jar for the entire week, which is the mason jar you see in this picture. Um, we, we composted over um, 28 pounds of food waste, um, and we, we diverted um, from landfill through recycling and terracycling um, about 23 pounds. And so... And overall, that was that was our waste right there for 12 people over um, over seven days, which was very impressive. And we did that because we avoided trash. We brought our own water bottles and our own cutlery and our own napkins and utilized those. And we shared meals to reduce our food waste. And we brought bulk snacks. And, um, and we worked with the hotels and the restaurants to make sure we didn't use any single-use plastics. And it was a really powerful trip because at the end of the day, these, these travelers who, who were just like you guys, they didn't come into this with an expertise in this, but they knew they wanted to be a part of the change. And so they had this experience, and at the end of it, where we had all these conversations about what was difficult, what was empowering, um, they, they all had conversations with me at the end about what they could do when they went home to their communities. What was the call to action that they could take home and do, you know, how could they implement a better recycling program? How could they share with their communities um, better reusable materials um, in their you know, in, whether it's in their gyms or in their schools or in their um, golf clubs. And it was, it, was really, it was really great because, again, it, it's not about, it's, you know, it, understanding the value of these issues and how they impact these precious ecosystems is super important, but it's, it's about feeling the ability to be a part of that solution that has been amazing with this plastic waste issue. We saw it with the straw, 
that everybody was willing to just give up the straw because that was the thing that they could touch down and do today and feel empowered about. And so I think that today people are asking, what's next? What can I do that is more to help solve this really devastating issue? And so I'm going to leave you guys before we go to questions with what I think you guys can do because everyone um, has a role to play, right? So we can be good stewards by reuse to begin with, right? Bringing your own water bottles, um, asking your parents to bring their own coffee mugs, um, stopping, to use the, stopping using disposable straws and use a reusable one if you really want to, um, bringing reusable grocery bags, and, um, and also reusable containers for takeout when you go to restaurants. And then also recycling, recycling in your homes, recycling in your classrooms, um, and, and asking the question to your parents as you're shopping, is that material recyclable? Can we, can we look at the label? You know, have the conversation as much as possible because, you know, everybody can do something here. Every, every, all of those little steps count. And so even though it feels overwhelming when you see that beach full of plastic, um, I, I have great hope because today everyone is engaged and everyone cares. And so um, we're going to be a part of that solution to getting us to no plastics in nature by 2030. 